of Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. And today I am lucky enough to be with Linda Moore. Linda, could you give us a 60 second elevator pitch about who you are and what you write? Hi, I'm Linda Moore, a recovering gallery owner who wrote a novel, a debut novel about called Attribution. It's about an art historian who finds a painting hidden in the basement of her university and she believes it's a golden age masterpiece. So she takes it to Spain and looks for experts to prove it. All right. I love this topic. It sounds a little bit like a mystery wrapped in an adventure, wrapped in an education about art. It is that, although it's frustrating because people want to put it in a genre niche, like what shelf does it go on in the library? And uh, I, I sort of actually like that because it appeals to a broad range of readers. And I love when people who aren't necessarily into art tell me they love the art parts because they learn something without being overwhelmed or needing a a big background in art. So I'm excited about the early response. Well, that's really fun. I took a handful of art classes in college and I had the opportunity to study abroad. So when I was there, we would go to the museum and then we would talk about the pieces. And then we would go to another museum and then we talk about the pieces or we do the other way around. We talk about the pieces and we go to the museum and experience it, which was a really great way to have an immersive education about art. But I find that a lot of people make assumptions about art without truly understanding much about it. Well, that's part of the story in the book. It's called Attribution. And there are those who say we may have as much as 40% of the art hanging on walls and museums in America that is wrongly attributed. And part of that is because people traveled to Europe when they did the grand tour and they brought home works and they said, oh, this is a, a Canaletto from Venice. And everybody passed that on until somebody finally donated it to a museum and they just accepted that. It's, uh, I find it fascinating. And I think sometimes art historians are so caught up in telling you everything they know. When they take you on tour, it, it's overwhelming. But I think these are great adventure stories. And some of these artists live wild lives. I love that you went abroad. I too went abroad. And my my year abroad was in Madrid. So it's uh, my first love. Where did you go? I was in London. I was in London. So oh, that's cool. Yeah, I know. I was like, I don't speak any other languages but English. So I'm going to go to an English speaking country. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you probably uh, you probably saw in the National Gallery the Rokeby Venus painting that is on the cover of the book, which uh, a detail of it is on the cover of the book. And that famous Velasquez painting that has its own crazy history where a suffragette came in the museum and slashed it with a knife. And it was uh, repaired, thankfully, but I think there were like 12 gashes in it. It's under glass now, but that was over 100 years ago. And it is it ha- has had a lot of interesting travel since it left uh, Velasquez's studio, we assume, either in Italy or in Spain in the Royal Palace. So it has a lot of interesting stories as the only surviving nude that Velasquez painted. That's uh, th- that's a very fun detail. I want to ask about putting artwork on a cover. Did you have to get copyright permission? Yes, that detail, uh, we obtained the permission to use the photograph. It has restrictions, so you won't see it on tote bags. And you won't see it uh, in postcards and that sort of thing. We can use it as a cover, but we really can't do much with uh, the image itself, which is fine. I I think that's appropriate. And um, I don't know what happens. We're going to do an audio book. So I'm not sure what will happen when we do the new cover, if we have to get more permissions, probably. 
it's never you, it, with artwork. I think it's always important to be careful about uh, using these images and making sure that the museum who owns the work or the collector who owns the work is uh, uh, on board with the way the image is being used. That's an interesting fact. I actually hadn't thought about it. I know that if I go onto Canva, there's free things I can use and there's ones that I'm supposed to purchase. And, and you know, when you pay for a membership, like I pay for the annual mem membership, you know, then all those, it, it unlocks all those images for me. So I'm, I just use those images without a problem. However, I, it's not artwork. It's not and, no, no. and I'm sure Canva uh, does some careful diligence over what they allow you to access in even in that paid version. Um, probably you'll remember when you were a student that the museums all had signs up, no photographs, no photographs. Sometimes still there will be wall labels that say you can photograph this, but you can't photograph that. It's nearly impossible for museums to regulate this and monitor it. So they, they've sort of given up. And most sites like the National Gallery in London, you go on there and you look and they will say that if you made a photograph and you want it for your own personal use, like here's my vacation photos or whatever, uh, that that's fine. But once you go beyond that, I think then they ask that you support uh, the, the photo policies of the museum. So your novel's based in Spain. And since you spent a year abroad, did you spend more than a year abroad other times? Well, or? I've been, I've, I'm a world traveler. I have been to over a hundred countries. I, I, I was thinking last night, how many times have I been to Spain? I actually, certainly more than 10 but I can't tell you, I, I lived with a family and they became friends. So we are still friends. So I consider them my Spanish family and I go visit them. And um, one of them married an American. So he lives in St. Louis part of the time. And uh, another one um, is, uh, uh, has a house in the South of Spain where the family's from, but there are still a lot of, a lot of the families in Madrid. So I visit them, but I've also gone just to try to explore places that I maybe didn't get to know as well when I lived there, like Seville was one place. There was no fast train in my day. And uh, they, uh, and oh my gosh, Seville is such a fascinating place. Uh, the history, it's not difficult to get your imagination uh, excited as you walk the same cobblestones that were there when Velasquez was a young student of art there, and he ended up marrying his uh, teacher, his tutor's daughter, and he became a very uh, quickly came to the attention of the Count Duke of Olivares, which is how he ended up in Madrid. And that's all part of the story too. It's not a historical novel. Some people want to call it that, but it's all takes place in our own times. So it's a very much a contemporary novel, uh, but our protagonist is researching history. So you will get a interesting history along the way. Mm, I love it. That sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. I was just thinking we spent five years living in Morocco and there's a little oh. tiny section in Morocco. There's actually two, but there's a tiny section in Morocco called Ceuta, which is right across from Gibraltar, which of course is in Spain. <laughs> so we well, have this little, actually, Gibraltar these little, is England, <laughs> right? But it's, I, it's, it's in, I know, it's, I it's know in I've Spain and Ceuta. Then Ceuta is in Morocco, but it's Spanish. So we, you know, we would often go to Spain via the ferry and sometimes right. we would either go through there or we would, would go through one of the other ports, but the, the ferry was maybe uh, whatever, two hour, one hour, two hour ride. And, and it's probably uh, faster just, now. Uh, yeah. I was actually spent uh, two and a half weeks in Morocco before COVID right before COVID. And I love Morocco. It's such a fascinating place, but it's a reminder of, the history of that region where the uh, 
the Moors, not Linda Moore, but the Moors, uh, had control. And as some people say, the most important thing that happened in 1492 was that the Spanish beat the Moors and made them leave Granada and the rest of Spain for good because they held uh, territory almost all the way to the French border at one point. So there's no getting around the influence that culture had on Spain. And interesting uh, paradigms of that era because they were so open to multicultures that it was a time of great advancement where uh, Jewish scholars and Muslims had a lot of scientific advancements. And of course, you combine that with the libraries that the uh, monks were keeping for the Catholic Church. And everybody seemed to get along until uh, that 1492 date. And Isabel first declared that she would allow all of these people to stay in Spain and hold their religion. But quickly, the church exercised its authority and pushed them to convert. I have this wonderful 500-year-old uh, page out of a book that shows an etching where they're all standing around with their various um, uh, costume, native dress that is uh, close to their practices of headgear and all the rest. And, <clears throat> and then there's another photo of them all lining up to be baptized. So uh, it was a time of a great uh, upheaval. And that always makes for an interesting story, doesn't it? It sure does. I, we were able to visit Rhonda in Spain, oh, yeah. which is talk about a, that that's got some oh, that type of history. Um, and they have a the big gorge that's there. And I think uh, many yeah, people were pushed it's to their death. Town. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, it was I, a I brutal highly recommend, time, right? <laughs> I highly recommend traveling and exploring the different places in the world. But it is such great fodder for our literary imaginations. Correct. Yes. And there are so many stories. Uh, honestly, I think it's hard to make up stories that are as good as the ones that actually happened. Uh, and some of that's true. So there, I, there's some author's notes at the back of the book, which talk about things I thought I was uh, uh, were fiction. And it ended up that I discovered details that supported what I thought I'd made up. But it's, it's just, a, I, I, found, I find the research the most interesting part of the book. And I think people who enjoy a good story, first of all, a good story, will enjoy the book as well as people who uh, like history, like art, like uh, interesting characters and mysteries and puzzles to figure out. I think they'll they'll all enjoy the book. And so what's next for you? Well, I wrote a novel. The first novel I ever wrote was called Five Days in Bogota. My actual special area and my art gallery represented this was uh, Latin America, not Mexico, but Latin American art especially the Southern Cone, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and some Colombian. So this book was inspired by a trip I made to Bogota in uh, 1991, which was the height of the Medellin and Cali cartel drug wars. How I got it in my head that it was a good idea to go take art to an art fair in that time, I, I really don't know looking back on it, but that's what this protagonist does. She's recently widowed and she goes to this art fair because she's told there will be wealthy collectors there. So what could go wrong, right? Um, and she is, uh, so this book I submitted when I first wrote it to a contest. And not only did I not win, I got rather ruthless comments from the judges. And I thank them for that because they it made me know that I needed to learn how to write fiction. 
And so I went back to school to Stanford for two years to finish their novel writing program. And uh, it was it was a good uh, thing I did that because I learned a lot and I loved the story of that book and so did the judges, but the writing needed to be improved. And I think now also the story is going to have more layers to it than it originally did. So I'm excited that will come out in 2024. That's very exciting for you. Great news. Great news. Linda Moore, how can people discover more? How can they connect with you? Well, uh, first of all, a good starting place is always to look for attribution wherever books are sold. And there's a lot of information in the book itself. My website is Linda Moore, M-O-O-R-E, author.com. And that's a good starting place because it links to a lot of other things. We will be on book tour. Pub day is tomorrow. Yay, book birthday. And it will, uh, and we will kick off a tour beginning in Seattle on October 21st. I'll be in conversation with Joshua Moore, who is a terrific writer uh, and also was a, a professor of mine at Stanford. So I am excited to uh, have the book in the world officially. All right. Well, Linda, are you ready to switch to our rapid fire questions? I am. I am. Are you going to ask me the name of my novel? I hope so. Attribution. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> Actually, I was going to start with, do you have any stickers on your refrigerator? Oh, no. My refrigerator uh, is has a panel. It's not magnetic. <laughs> So I, they would fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and do you prefer paperbacks or hardcover books? Well, I learned through this process that hardcover books take up a lot of trees, more trees than paperbacks. Who knew? So I sort of feel it's not only economical, but it's eco-friendly to have a paperback book. And uh, my book starts with paperback, but it will be an ebook, which is even more eco-friendly, I think. And do you have a favorite keepsake? Oh gosh, I have many. I have a pair of uh, pearl earrings. I don't have them on today. They're black pearls. And my kids gave them to me when they were in high school. Dad sent them off with a credit card. And the lady at the store told them these words, goes with jeans, goes with fancy. <laughs> so I wear those and every time I do my children, I wear them a lot. And my children say to me, goes with jeans, goes with fancy. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, I love those earrings. Linda Moore, thank you so much for stopping by. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to meet you, Allison, and good luck with your podcast. Thank you. You have been listening to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison out. Woo. We're all done. Linda Moore is an author, traveler, and a recovering gallery owner. She studied art history at the Prado while a student at the University of Madrid and received degrees from the University of California and Stanford University. Her gallery featured contemporary Hispanic artists. She has published award-winning exhibition catalogs and her writing has appeared in art journals and anthologies. Born in the Midwest, she resides with her husband in California when not spending time traveling the world. For more information, visit Linda Moore's website at lindamoreauthor.com. For more information about the Florida Writers Association, visit us at floridawriters.org. Until next time.